This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Roger Shin, Union Theological Seminary, New York City, discusses social responsibility and the goals of science. There's very little that I can say about Professor Shin that um, is not already well known. The author of many books, a professor of the distinguished seminary of this country, uh, on the, um, I am not a graduate of Union either, <laughs> a person who has been in much demand in scientific, seminar, or scientific universities to dialogue with scientists, and, on the, and uh, on the editorial board of one of the distinguished magazines of theolo theological opinion, Professor Shin has an, uh, a reputation which I'm afraid cannot be matched by very many other people. Without bogging this up anymore, I think I should at this time introduce to you Professor Roger Shin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subject you've asked me to talk about has to do with some of the relationships between the advances of science in our time and the social ethical problems that we all face. I'd like to start by describing a change of mood that I think I see in uh, the uh, scientific community at this point. I say I think I see it because I'm uh, not sure just how well I could uh, vindicate uh, this observation. My uh, judgments are impressionistic, but uh, I'll give them to you for you to uh, think about. It was uh, only 11 years ago that uh, C.P. Snow published his book, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution. And one of the several themes of the book was that one of these cultures, the scientific technological, as he saw it, was basically optimistic about man's social condition. That uh, it was a culture that was uh, trained in problem solving. It saw a difficulty, it defined a problem, it got its uh, method of uh, attack and uh, went to it with the confidence it could be solved. It believed that solutions were available and methods for uh, finding them were at hand. The other culture, said Sir Charles Snow, the literary intellectual culture was much more pessimistic. Uh, it was inclined to regard the uh, scientists as uh, shallowly optimistic, whereas it uh, reveled in uh, existentialist uh, angst and uh, dismal forebodings about uh, man and his uh, future. Now, it's possible to make many uh, criticisms of uh, C.P. Snow's uh, thesis. Uh, for one thing, he uh, lumped the scientific and the technological, which uh, sometimes seem to belong to the same culture and sometimes seem uh, very different. Uh, he said a uh, little about the uh, social sciences, which uh, don't quite fit uh, either pattern, so on. But at the time, I did check out his thesis on confidence, optimism, with a few of my friends in the uh, physical sciences, and they at least vindicated it. They said, yeah, uh, you people in the humanities, uh, literature, uh, the arts, and theology love to make uh, people uh, feel despair and uh, all this existentialist uh, stuff. Uh, we scientists are much more confident about the world in the future. Uh, recently, there have been a good many signs of a change. There is an apocalyptic anxiety among some scientists. Now, I do not say that all scientists feel this. What I can say is that most of the apocalyptic sayings that I have encountered recently have come from scientists, not from the literary artistic culture. When the American Museum of Natural History set up its centennial exhibit last summer, the theme was, Can Man Survive? 
at the meetings of the uh, American Association of the Advancement of Science in Boston between Christmas and New Year's last year. There are a great many of these uh, sayings of uh, dark foreboding from the scientists. Uh, I attended in particular the three-day session that was co-sponsored by the AAAS and the Boston University School of Theology on uh, theology and the life sciences. Uh, John Platt was there, uh, who uh, spoke uh, here a year or so ago, a research biophysicist and associate director of the University of Michigan Mental Health Research Institute, uh, making his familiar theme that today we have mankind has a shorter life expectancy than ever in the world before, uh, giving his estimate that we may have less than a 50-50 chance of surviving until 1980. Another uh, scientist in the uh, group uh, studying population problems said, uh, we are not a group that can project answers for the future. We're conducting a wake for mankind. Isaac Asimov, the famous science fiction uh, writer who uh, recently uh, published his uh, 100th uh, book, who also is a, uh, holds a chair in uh, science on the uh, faculty at uh, Boston University, was uh, accused uh, in the uh, conversations of uh, being an utter pessimist, but uh, full of uh, wit and uh, laughter. And he answered by saying there were two ancient philosophers, uh, Heraclitus, the weeping philosopher who wept over the follies of mankind, Democritus, the laughing philosopher who laughed over the follies of mankind. Asimov said, I laugh so that I won't have to weep. Now. You see, I am not at all trying to make an empirical generalization that uh, all scientists are pessimists or anything like that. I am saying that there are dismal projections of our future coming from the culture that 11 years ago C.P. Snow described as the confident culture within our uh, society. Now, if we ask why this is, I think it's because of a multiplication of specific problems, and I generalize it this way. Scientific advance and the technological advance that is dependent upon it solve some problems, and in solving some, make other problems. They solve some ethical problems. For instance, uh, if a society, like most societies in pre-scientific times, is periodically threatened by uh, famine, it faces a uh, one of the most uh, insoluble of all ethical problems. When there's not enough food to keep everybody alive, uh, who gets to eat? If technology means that a given society does not have to have famines, that particular problem is uh, erased as a uh, troubling ethical problem. But a further set of problems is likely to arise. Science and technology tend to heighten some problems. The most obvious would be that set of problems caused by nuclear weapons. Now, you see, I'm not at all saying science creates the problem, or human hostilities, or just our uh, functioning as human beings, creates problems that make for conflict and often war. People uh, use weapons uh, because uh, people tend to be that way. What science and technology do is make available more destructive weapons than we had in the past, so that our hostilities can have far more serious consequences than before. And this means that this and other problems mean that in our society today, a great many people are afraid of science and are sometimes turning against it. I do not say this to endorse it. I say it to describe the situation. Alvin Weinberg, for instance, director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, recently wrote, science and its technologies are today on the defensive, the victims of an attack which is most noticeable in the United States. Now, in this situation, I should like to state tonight three propositions and to open up each one. I'll not have time to uh, vindicate each one with care. and. Uh, that may be an excuse. It's uh, quite possible that I could not vindicate each one of them to your satisfaction. But I say I'd like to state it and uh, kind of open it up, uh, state my reasons for believing it, and then uh, you'll have your chance to uh, question me, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. 
Let me state the three before I go into any one. The first, which I've already hinted at, scientific advance and the technological advance that uh, often grows out of it, creates new problems of ethics, which almost always come out to be problems of political ethics. The second, scientific advance requires certain fundamental revisions of our religious attitudes and theological understandings. And third, scientists and the highly proficient technologists of our time have a peculiar moral responsibility. I do not say a unique one, but a peculiar one. Now each in turn. First, scientific advance and technological advance create certain new problems of political ethics. The most obvious of these I've mentioned are connected with nuclear weapons. That's so obvious I'll not say any more about it. Uh, I just want you to understand I'm haven't forgotten it. I uh, don't think it's unimportant, but uh, we've heard enough about it that uh, I'll let it go and uh, get on to uh, some others that uh, are not quite so dramatic, though uh, they're dramatic enough. Let me mention three. First, uh, population. As you know, uh, we're proceeding at a rate that uh, doubles the world's population in about uh, 35 years. To put it another way, it took all of human history uh, somewhere upwards of a uh, million years, for the Earth's population to grow to the figure of one billion, somewhere around uh, 1850. Now we add a billion, see what used to take a million years to do, we add a billion in about 15 years. And uh, you know the uh, game of projections that uh, you can uh, go on with uh, here, that uh, if this rate were to continue, I assure you I don't think it will, but if it were to continue, in 600 uh, years there'd be a person per every uh, square yard of uh, Earth, and uh, on uh, keep projecting the time when uh, mankind would outweigh the uh, Earth and uh, even the solar system and uh, all of that. And I don't have to tell you it won't happen. The interesting question will be, uh, what's going to prevent it from happening? Is that uh, will we learn to handle this in a uh, humane way or in some other ways? Now, I would not say that uh, modern science causes people to reproduce or uh, other causes for that. This is not a scientifically caused problem in an exclusive sense. It's a very old problem in certain areas of the world. I think this is the first time when it's been seen as a global problem. But uh, there are a number of traditional solutions for it. Uh, nature provided some. Malaria was uh, one uh, very uh, effective uh, way of uh, keeping the population down in parts of the world. Uh, starvation's been uh, another way. And what science does is the basically beneficent thing of interfering with nature's methods, but uh, presenting uh, some problems as it does so. Uh, man has also used uh, various devices, including uh, infanticide, uh, the uh, destruction of old people, uh, war, uh, which uh, kills off people, and the winners have more space to live in, the losers less, but a few uh, less of both, and so uh, this sometimes helps but it's not a very good way of doing it. In any event, because we are so successful in inhibiting nature's population controls, we have this problem on our hands. It's uh, recently been described by a number of demographers in a, a rather new phrase, the problem of the wanted child. That is, uh, the old uh, assumption that uh, there's a threat of population because too many families have unwanted uh, children no longer is adequate. Uh, a lot of people want more children than uh, is really good for the planet Earth. And if people want to have more children than is socially desirable, you're presented with the need for a social policy to do something about this. Now, some societies have devised these. In uh, parts of China, not the whole country, but in uh, parts, according to the uh, best information I can uh, get, the uh, province uh, governments have simply said, uh, we will give no additional ration cards to families uh, having children beyond two. 
Now this is a uh, stern measure, but you see it's a public policy to limit population. Uh, there are great debates going on now as to uh, how soon uh, mankind or the United States may have to come to compulsory limitations of the family. Uh, there are great disagreements among the uh, most involved uh, workers in this area. Uh, Philip Hauser of the University of Chicago, Roger Revelle of Harvard tend to put a greater trust on voluntary methods than uh, the Californians, Paul Ehrlich and uh, Garrett uh, Hardin. Uh, Garrett Hardin says of voluntary controls are insanity. We uh, must come down to compulsion. Now I mention this, you see, not to take sides on it, but to say that this is the nature of the ethical issue that is caused by what's initially a human triumph. The uh, interference with death, which uh, has in the past uh, made uh, uh, such a high rate of uh, infant mortality. We uh, cut that down. Uh, we never stop death, but we postpone it until uh, after most people have done some reproduction. So a basic human triumph presents us with a very difficult social problem, which finally is going to call for a political solution. Now, I don't mean that necessarily it's going to be an act of Congress. It might be. But this has got to be approached on grounds of a social policy designed perhaps to persuade, perhaps to compel people to limit reproduction. And this will mean an interference in the lives of people in an area that has often been considered the most uh, delicate and the uh, most personal. The usual uh, methods of uh, enforcement are uh, compulsory uh, um, sterilization or compulsory abortion. And uh, these would certainly be offensive to some people. They would say, uh, whatever the government may do to me, it may uh, tax me, it may uh, draft me, uh, I don't want it doing this. But the government may decide to do that. I'm not ready to predict it uh, will. I'm suggesting that the advance of scientific technology here in the area of health requires an ethical decision that must be resolved in the social political area. A second example, ecology. You had uh, Earth Week uh, last week, and I don't think I have to uh, go into any uh, detail into the uh, problems here. Uh, let me uh, quote Robert Heilbronner, the uh, economist, who says, the ecological crisis may indeed constitute the most dangerous and difficult challenge that humanity has ever faced. Uh, I'm supposed to give uh, a couple examples of this, uh, just to uh, refresh uh, your mind on uh, things that are being said uh, very widely these days. Uh, every city in the United States faces a terrific problem as to what it'll do with a motor car that uh, is not only uh, polluting the atmosphere but uh, crowding the uh, streets and uh, just making the uh, cities increasingly uh, inhuman places uh, to live. Uh, uh, every city is puzzled at what's going to do about waste disposal. The uh, average figure which rises every year is that uh, currently uh, we produce uh, solid waste at the rate of uh, 5.3 pounds per day per uh, individual. Uh, multiply it out, it's about a ton a year per individual. And I think there's not a city in the United States knows what it's going to do with this uh, 10 years hence. Uh, take. Uh, Again, just as an example, uh, because uh, the, the basic generalizations have been made, and all I'm trying to do is uh, recall them uh, to your mind. Uh, take the area where uh, I grew up in Ohio. The uh, Cuyahoga River is uh, so polluted with uh, oil waste that uh, the river, mind you, caught fire last year and burnt down uh, two bridges. <laughs> and it uh, pours these into uh, Lake Erie, which has uh, got so bad that uh, the best uh, estimate uh, I can find is that uh, if all the pollution of Lake Erie were to stop tomorrow, 
even to get it back to the relative purity of 25 years ago when I used to uh, swim there would require uh, $40 billion and uh, upwards of 50 years. Well, uh, this kind of thing uh, we're up against. Uh, there are areas here of great uncertainty. We, we really don't know. And uh, I, who am uh, not a scientist, uh, you know, I, I sort of take the word of a scientist. Uh, he can uh, just intimidate me with his uh, knowledge. And then when they start disagreeing with each other, uh, I don't know uh, what to say. But uh, now just take this uh, fact of the, uh, the increase of carbon dioxide in the air. I'm not talking about poisons now, like carbon monoxide. It's a carbon dioxide. Uh, there's the, the whole tendency of animal life and of industry is to consume oxygen, produce carbon dioxide. There are a number of uh, plant processes that reverse it, and uh, you keep uh, something of a uh, balance going here. Uh, the best evidence I can get is that we really don't know, nobody knows, at what point there's a, a dangerous threshold that you cross here, which uh, may have uh, what's sometimes called the uh, greenhouse effect, a possible uh, heating up of the uh, earth by uh, only a few degrees, but uh, that's all it takes to start uh, polar ice caps uh, uh, melting and the uh, inundation of a lot of uh, coastal cities. Now, you and uh, Iowa might not care about that, but uh, I do. And uh, it bugs me once in a while. Now, my point is not to say that I know when this is going to happen. I don't. The point is to say we are going ahead with a lot of decisions made by individuals, industries, and so on when nobody knows. And we really haven't calculated the kind of r risk we're taking. Now, the ecological problem is the result of, in part, the population growth, in part, a high consumption society, a society that uh, eats a lot of meat, uh, drives automobiles, uh, travels in uh, airplanes, uh, consumes immense amounts of uh, paper and uh, everything else. Uh, the uh, estimate of uh, Paul Ehrlich, uh, and nobody can make a very precise estimate here. I've seen uh, estimates of very on both sides of it. Uh, Paul Ehrlich's estimate is that each American is 50 times more of a burden on the environment than each child in India. Which means, uh, you see, it, it may be that ecologically speaking, America is more overpopulated than India. Uh, absolutely, of course, India is far more uh, overpopulated than we. But we exploit not only our own natural resources and pollute not only our own air, we import tremendous resources from other countries and uh, do a fair job of uh, polluting uh, the air if we get those uh, supersonic uh, transports. Uh, and nobody knows where that's all going to uh, fall out. Now the solution to all of this may be partly in the same technology that so far has contributed to the problem is if we really get a successful technology of recycling, then uh, technology can help us a great deal on this. But it won't do it without certain political decisions for this reason. Right now, it usually is more profitable to pollute than to recycle. It's a more profitable at some places simply to dump old automobiles in the ocean than to uh, tear them down and uh, use the uh, materials in them. Now, it could be made less profitable by certain uh, devices of uh, taxation. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of ways of doing this, you see. But this will depend on a concept that uh, we really haven't waked up to, and uh, nobody quite knows how it would work, though the basic idea is uh, sensible enough, a kind of social cost accounting. It's cheaper for an individual factory to pour its waste into a river than it is to uh, dispose of these some other way. It's more expensive for the society. And if a system of social accounting can relate costs of individuals or corporations to the total social cost, uh, we can uh, perhaps begin to work our way out of it. But that, you see, I hope you see, uh, vindicates my point that the change requires a political ethical solution. And that's a very hard kind of a change to uh, work out. The third example I want to give is that of genetics. 
Uh, this follows from, uh, it doesn't follow exactly from the uh, population one. It's got its own grounds, but in one way it follows. The uh, demographers say we should settle down to the uh, expectation of uh, no more than two ch children uh, per family. You say that to a geneticist, and he says, no, not two per family. None for some families, one for some, two for some, three for some, and uh, maybe four for a few. Because he's interested not so much in the net numbers as he is in the genetic quality of the uh, children produced. And this really raises some controversial issues. At the meetings in Boston that I mentioned, in uh, one of the sessions on genetics, one of the geneticists, or several of the geneticists, were describing the kind of heredity that they thought was desirable for children, the sort of a human race that they would like to produce when their genetic skills got a little greater. And then somebody not a geneticist said, uh, I am a little bit afraid of this uh, world you're uh, projecting. Uh, uh, there wouldn't be any possibility in it, would there, for a uh, Dostoevsky? And one of the geneticists replied, the human race cannot afford another Dostoevsky. It was kind of a shudder went through uh, half of the uh, room anyhow. Uh, uh, now, you know, uh, I wouldn't let Dostoevsky as my next door neighbor. Uh, he, he really was a character, and uh, nobody found him easy to uh, live with. But uh, are we to say uh, that there can't be such persons in uh, our society? And uh, when the attack was mounted, the geneticist who had offered the suggestion retracted in part and said, all right, uh, we won't say there can't be another Dostoevsky, but if there is one, he can't reproduce. That's the uh, genetic uh, point. Now, I indicate this simply to suggest the kind of problem that gets involved. At the Boston meeting, there was one dramatic incident at which the issue was joined on genetics. A Bernard Davis of the Harvard Medical School read a paper on genetics, which uh, was very moderate as these things go, uh, far more moderate than uh, Herbert Muller uh, used to uh, uh, present. Uh, but he did suggest a little uh, changing around of the uh, composition of the uh, human race. And then he was uh, attacked by a young man who had not been in the program who, uh, in the fashion of our uh, day, uh, demanded time to uh, respond, and uh, he was given it. The young man looked vaguely familiar to me, but it was not until I talked to some other people uh, I uh, recognized him because I'd seen his picture in the uh, press in the preceding November. He was part of the team at uh, Harvard that uh, succeeded for the first time in isolating the gene. And uh, this was described as an achievement of uh, Nobel uh, proportions. Whether it ever gets uh, that award or not, uh, Nobel, no. But uh, a really uh, immense accomplishment. I'd read the comments of some of the team at the time they did this. The leader of the team, Dr. Beckwith, said, it becomes more and more frightening. This is their, their achievement, he meant. It becomes more and more frightening especially when we see work in biology used by our government in Vietnam and in devising chemical and biological weapons. And Dr. Shapiro, the man whom I uh, vaguely uh, recognized who was uh, interrupting the uh, meeting, added, the work we have done may have bad consequences over which we have no control. The use by the government is the thing that frightens us. Well, Dr. Shapiro demanded time and was given time and responded to Dr. Bernard Davis with an all-out attack upon the whole science of genetics. He renounced everything that he had done as a scientist up to that stage in his career and indicated he was abandoning a uh, scientific career to uh, throw his lot into uh, political action. Now, you may or may not agree with his uh, politics. You can make up your mind as I uh, quote him uh, a little uh, further, but uh, that's not the point. The, uh, well, I'll make the point in a minute and uh, quote him uh, first. Uh, he said, as long as the use of our discoveries will be determined by men like Nixon and Agnew, I want to have no part in making such discoveries. 
Now, I say again, it's up to you whether you agree with his politics, but you can hardly reject totally the notion that the man who makes the discovery does not retain the right to dictate its use. Uh, our society in other processes, which broadly speaking are political processes, determines the use of the discoveries. Now, Dr. Shapiro felt so strongly on this that he advocated that all further research in genetics be forbidden. Bernard Davis replied by saying, you can't do this because the basic research in genetics is indistinguishable from the uh, basic research in the nature of the cell, in uh, cancer uh, research, and uh, so on. To which Shapiro's reply was, uh, I would forbid all cancer research. The alternative that uh, he proposed was to uh, cut out uh, pollution of the air, smoking, and food additives, and to make that your uh, cancer uh, help uh, me measures, and uh, stop the uh, research. Now, I do not share Dr. Shapiro's, uh, what to me looks like anti-intellectualism, this, uh, this rejection of science. I use him as an example of the fact that the scientific and technological advance creates both opportunities and problems that are going to be met not just by the scientist, but by the society at large through its social and political processes. scientific and technological advance call for a revision in religious attitudes and theological understanding. I'm not talking tonight on the theoretical level. That is, I'm not saying that uh, science by showing us an ordered universe makes impossible certain of the, uh, of the uh, anthropomorphic uh, conceptions of God of the past. I think it's an issue well worth discussing but it uh, gets you into uh, certain uh, metaphysical issues and so on, which just aren't my topic tonight. I'm rather concerned in the more practical area. The basic Western religious attitude, whether among uh, those of us who uh, consider ourselves religious or those of us who don't consider ourselves religious, still the, uh, the basic outlook on uh, man and his relation to the universe tends to be pretty anthropocentric. Uh, Western humanism, unlike some of the humanisms of the uh, Orient, tend uh, to uh, separate man from nature rather than uh, have man uh, find his uh, locus uh, in nature. Now a good many Christian theologians have in recent years pointed this out for the purpose of taking credit for it. Uh, Harvey Cox, for instance, in the secular city. Ernst uh, van uh, Leeuwen, uh, and uh, many others have done this. That is, they have made the claim that the Jewish Christian religious heritage has contributed to the advance of science through its monotheism, which says nature isn't full of gods and spirits. The uh, technical phrase that some of you are quite familiar with is that monotheism desacralizes the world and then kind of gives man a uh, hunting license to uh, exploit his environment. And I say there have been a good many uh, theologians have uh, taken uh, credit for this. So this is why uh, Western man is so much more successful than Eastern man. He's got none of that uh, gushy uh, pantheism, uh, none of this uh, polytheism that makes you afraid to uh, cut down a uh, tree or dam up a uh, stream. Uh, we go ahead uh, uninhibited and uh, subdue the earth for our uh, human purposes. Now, it was uh, a little over uh, two years ago that uh, Lynn White, the uh, UCLA historian at the, uh, meaning the AAAS, read a uh, paper that has become uh, quite famous 
since then, in which he made the basic point, uh, if that's right, don't take credit for it, uh, you got to take the blame for it. But the Orient's been wiser than we here. That the destructive activities of Western man are rooted in a basically anthropocentric religious and uh, moral outlook in which man does not feel his kinship with nature, but his, uh, stand, feels himself uh, standing off against nature uh, to uh, exploit it without inhibitions. Uh, Lynn White suggested that uh, in something like Zen Buddhism, there might be a corrective for this. Or in our own tradition, he suggested that the, uh, the general uh, religious attitude of uh, St. Francis of Assisi, who uh, looked out in the world and saw uh, Brother Fire and uh, Sister Water and uh, so on, uh, might be uh, much more healthy than uh, the uh, separation that we've driven, the uh, basic uh, predatory spirit that we've taken uh, toward uh, the earth. Uh, there are good many others saying something of the same sort. Paul Goodman, for instance, has uh, said we are going through and we need to go through a kind of religious transformation, a new reformation, liberation from the horror of Babylon and return to the pure faith. And it must be an ecologically more constructive faith. Uh, Kenneth Boulding, the uh, distinguished uh, economist, has uh, developed uh, the uh, notion that's now become quite familiar that uh, we're, the Earth really is a spaceship in which everything must be uh, recycled, used over and over again. And he too points to uh, some of the religions of the Orient as a uh, necessary corrective uh, for the anthropocentric religion of Western man. Let me read just a uh, word from uh, Lynn White on this. He says, both our present science and our present technology are so tinctured with orthodox Christian arrogance toward nature that no solution for our ecologic crisis can be expected from them alone. Since the roots of our trouble are so largely religious, the remedy must also be essentially religious, whether we call it that or not. We must rethink and refeel our nature and destiny. Now, Lynn White knows that uh, in some ways we live in a post-religious age. He's uh, not saying that uh, this will necessarily take place through any uh, easily recognizable structured forms of religion. I mean, it might take place there as well, well as any place else, but it, uh, it won't be uh, limited to that. The, the real spirit is in that last sentence I quoted, we must rethink and refeel our nature and destiny. Well, that's my uh, second proposition. The scientific technological advance, again, not on the theoretical level, and this is a practical one, calls for revision in religious attitudes and theological understanding. The third one, which I uh, suspect will be controversial, is that scientists and technologists have what I'm calling a peculiar moral responsibility. Now, in one way, that's unfair. Uh, the scientist in the body politic is one citizen. I don't propose giving him more votes than uh, the rest of us uh, have. Uh, he's one person sharing in the political responsibility. Furthermore, his scientific skill does not necessarily make his ethical political judgments uh, any wiser than anybody else's. Uh, our society, uh, with its uh, habits of uh, making authority uh, figures, you know, is uh, inclined to think that a, uh, a uh, baseball player's uh, endorsement of a uh, product uh, gives it uh, some uh, special merit, when probably the ball player doesn't know any more about how the uh, product uh, works than uh, you or I. And we t sometimes tend to make scientific authority transferable into areas uh, where it doesn't apply. And uh, I think that is a mistake, the scientist may be no wiser than the next man in his political ethical judgments. What I'm suggesting is that there is a responsibility, an ethical responsibility that always goes with power. And the scientist has power. He knows how to understand certain processes 
and in the application of science, he knows how to do certain things. I'm saying that with power goes responsibility. Furthermore, what he knows may be very helpful to the rest of us as we try to make up our minds. He knows certain things about the effects of uh, radioactivity on human life that I don't know at all unless he's told me, unless he's written it, you see, and uh, I've read it. Uh, I don't have the skills to find that out. Uh, he knows about it. If he is introducing a new knowledge, a new power into our society, does not he have a responsibility to point out some of the possible consequences of it that the rest of us uh, just don't really know? Uh, this, I think, is why some of the uh, nuclear physicists uh, banded together and uh, started the uh, publication of a uh, journal. Now, I don't think that uh, nuclear physicists should have the right to dictate how nuclear physics should be used. A society uh, makes use of these things. They know certain things that must enter into any intelligent decisions made by the rest of us or uh, the uh, politicians that we elect to uh, do the decision making. And so at that point, he has a responsibility. I think uh, the scientist very often is a highly ethically sensitive man. Well, in general, I suppose the scientists are like other people that way, uh, some more, some uh, less. Uh, I don't see any uh, great difference. Uh, I say a great many of them are highly ethically sensitive. And they can raise the warning flags that the rest of us don't know enough to uh, raise. And I'm suggesting that because they can, and nobody else can, they have a responsibility to do that. But now comes a very difficult problem to which uh, I surely don't know the answer entirely by any means. How does the scientist make up his mind at these points where his achievements impinge upon hard ethical decisions? How does he decide whether he's going to be uh, pro-nuclear weapons or uh, anti or uh, pro-world government or uh, anti and uh, so on? Now, I'd like to use a particular case study here that uh, came to me from uh, one of my students, uh, Daniel McCracken, who's a computer specialist. He's uh, written some dozen books on uh, computers, uh, some uh, widely used as uh, textbooks. And though a uh, man at uh, mid-career, he uh, recently uh, decided to uh, subject himself to a uh, theological education, and he's just written a uh, thesis. Uh, we always say they write these theses uh, under me, you know. Uh, they uh, write them the way they choose to write them, as a rule, and uh, I'm uh, glad he did. Uh, uh, Daniel McCracken, uh, a few months back, established an organization called Computer Professionals Against the ABM. He got some of the uh, computer specialists of the highest prestige in the country, uh, got a total, I think, of about uh, 500, to join this organization and work against the uh, anti-ballistic missile program. Now, he got them to agree to come together and do this as technicians. And the one thing that they said that uh, wasn't being said by a whole lot of other political groups was they thought the thing wouldn't work. And they said, on the grounds of our skill in the use of computers, we think this is a system that is highly failure prone and can have disastrous results. I say he got a great many computer specialists who uh, put their reputations on the line and said either they knew it wouldn't work or they were deeply skeptical that it would work. They uh, communicated with uh, every uh, senator, with every uh, congressman, and uh, they had uh, some little impact, at least, uh, on uh, the uh, way some people made up their minds. Now, as Dan McCracken went into this, he found out that the Senate committee studying this was pitting the judgment of his group 
against a number of other computer specialists who said the thing would work. Then he asked himself the question, why does my group say it won't work? Why does the other group say it will work? Well, now you see, this is not presented as a judgment as to whether it's good or bad, whether it's morally right or wrong, just as to whether it'll work. It's technical judgment. He discovered that every computer specialist who testified to the Senate committee that it would work was employed either by the Defense Department on the project or by some corporation that was deeply involved in it, and they all said it would work. And all the men who said it wouldn't work really didn't believe in it anyhow. There's on the political and moral grounds, they were against it. And so he asked himself the question, now, are we really honest scientists giving our technical judgment, or are we propagandists uh, who make up our minds and uh, find the uh, scientific data to uh, fit in? Now, he, having discovered this, you see, he went back to analyze the process. He remained convinced that his original uh, reasoning was right, as on technical grounds, but he became very much aware of what uh, any of you who work in the sociology of knowledge know, that all our processes of inquiry and our uh, judgments are influenced by all kinds of factors that are not, strictly speaking, uh, scientific. This came up in the uh, Senate committee at uh, times in uh, an amusing way. For instance, the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Mr. Packard, was uh, testifying under uh, Senator Fulbright's uh, questioning. And uh, Fulbright uh, brought up this question. Look, all these experts you've uh, presented who say the thing will work, uh, I mean, you've hired them, or uh, corporations working this thing have uh, hired them. Uh, don't you have any other experts? And uh, Mr. Packard's reply was, uh, this is a scientific, objective question. The business who employs them has uh, nothing to do with it. Senator uh, Fulbright uh, handled it rather well. He said, uh, in effect, uh, you know, quit kidding me. Uh, he said, I come from Arkansas where we grow a lot of chickens. He said, I'm pro-chicken. Every senator knows this. I don't pretend to be objective about uh, chickens. It'd be silly if I did. Uh, everybody knows I'm pro-chicken. And uh, you don't have to, uh, you, you don't insult me if you tell me I'm not uh, objective here. Well, now, you see, what, what happened was the scientists and technologists giving their judgment on what was presumably an objective thing. Again, not whether it's good or bad for the human race, but whether the thing will work. Came out with utterly differing convictions. And that of itself wouldn't mean anything, just mean the state of our knowledge is tentative, except that their judgment on the scientific point reflected their general moral and social outlook on the nature of a problem. Now, where does this leave you? Well, you, you can't chip away at this problem. There's, at certain points, advances in knowledge, empirical and experimental techniques do resolve problems. They, they, they move us along a bit, you see. And sometimes we learn from them things that we're not predisposed to learn. You know, the evidence just uh, makes me change my mind, even if I uh, didn't want to. This, this can happen. But we get into this area where we're, we're sort of at the edges of our knowledge and that everybody who's interested enough to explore the problem is interested because he's got some kind of uh, conviction, uh, some kind of uh, concern, that tends to skew his reading of the evidence. Now, this is a basic human problem. It's not a problem of uh, scientists as uh, such. It's a uh, problem of all of us. Uh, we uh, read the evidence in the light of our ability to perceive. And our ability to perceive is uh, determined by uh, all kinds of things. It's a basic human problem. I'm suggesting the scientist technologist today is working on that problem at a peculiarly sensitive point. Now, just as an example of how difficult it gets, I'll uh, refer to uh, one of the answers that Mr. McCracken got as he set out to uh, organize this committee. 
certain technologists in the employ of the government said, you've got no right to organize such a committee because nobody has access to the data that will enable them to make a sound judgment except the men working on it. So nobody else got a right to say anything. And the men working on it are all for it. Now, McCracken would not buy that. Uh, he was convinced that others had access to sufficient data that they could make judgments. But uh, you see, the, the attempt to refute him boxed him in an insoluble problem. That is, if you so define expertise that the only experts are those who are committed, then uh, there's no challenging uh, them at all. You've just got uh, uh, an authority as uh, infallible as any uh, church has ever had, and everybody else is uh, humiliated into silence. Now, I'm not ready to uh, buy that. I am ready to grant that particularly in the polemical moods of today, we often tend to leap to conclusions without thinking through the technical aspects. I think it's important that we do that. But I don't think we have to be bluffed into utter silence on this business of accessibility of information. I remember uh, an amusing letter that uh, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. wrote to the uh, New York Times Magazine uh, sometime after he'd left the uh, White House. And uh, he had uh, become uh, quite critical of the government's policy in Vietnam. And uh, the uh, president at that time, uh, Johnson, and uh, some others were saying that uh, nobody who doesn't have access to all the secret data can really make a judgment on it. And uh, Schlesinger uh, Riley wrote, uh, one thing I learned when I was uh, in the White House uh, reading all this secret data is that those who just read the newspaper were much more accurately informed than those of us who got all the uh, inside information. So I think those of us who you know, sort of feel fenced off shouldn't be humbled into silence. But there are issues in which I don't have any technical knowledge. I must go to somebody who has. And when I do that, I must say, what has influenced his technical judgment in addition to technical expertise, which is a very real factor? And I say, I don't know quite how we're going to solve this. But I say it gives the scientist a peculiar moral responsibility in that public policy is so often dependent on his expert judgment. And then we've got to know whether his expert judgment follows from his expertise or from uh, the many social uh, pressures that uh, play on him as they uh, play on you and me. Now, I've uh, made uh, my uh, three propositions. I'll not uh, repeat them. Uh, you've heard them. Let me uh, put my peroration uh, this way and then uh, get ready for your uh, questions. Uh, in the uh, history of evolution, it appears that some species have perished because of the overdevelopment of some particular capacity. It started out having a uh, survival uh, value and then it, uh, it outgrew itself and uh, became a uh, liability. You hear wide conjectures today that man may be doomed because of the overdevelopment of his brain. That is, uh, he just may get uh, too smart for his own good. Uh, if he were a little dumber, he couldn't uh, do the job of destruction uh, quite so well. The other possibility, of course, is that he'll use his brain with some kind of ethical sensitivity that may enable him to survive and fashion a society where men may live in, live in peace and mutual appreciation of each other and of uh, the nature that's their home. Uh, I don't know uh, how it's going to come out, but uh, I've had my say, and uh, I'd like to hear your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, about this ABM, I was thinking, well, it's a, uh, well, I'm not in favor of the ABM. But that's a, the thing is that uh, the, on the ABM, you could get the, the 
two approaches that occur to me. You could get people who are opposed to it and people who are for it, get them together and argue, argue it out. And if this can be done on a rational scientific basis, it might be possible. Uh, one thing that happens quite frequently in those cases is that the, the difficulty is pinpointed and the chances of it to working are increased. Mm -hmm. The other thing that occurs to me is that what is usually done in science, or the science is question, is you try it out. That is, you use experiments. You make one, and you get more data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I comment on uh, each of those. Uh, the first is a method in which I believe. That is, I believe that just so far as possible in every controversial policy issue, you should isolate those factors which can be determined uh, empirically, experimentally, and uh, settle them. And then you may still have agreement, disagreements that are in the area of uh, basic values and social uh, commitments. But uh, don't argue over what can be solved. I think it becomes increasingly difficult to isolate that part that really can be solved. Uh, well, just shown by the, uh, the particular example. Uh, said, I don't say it's not a good idea. I just say uh, very often it's difficult to do, especially when you're working under time pressure. And uh, so often we seem to be uh, rushed into decisions. Now as to the, uh, the second uh, aspect, uh, this was uh, a most interesting part of this particular story. Because uh, you'll remember the decision was finally made was the shift from uh, was Sentinel to Safeguard or Safeguard to Sentinel. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a major shift in the plan and a decision to deploy ABMs to defend uh, two particular sites, launching sites rather than cities, and uh, to do this as an experiment and to see if the thing succeeded so it would be kind of a pilot project and uh, then you could uh, do some more. Well, now the Congress is being asked, the experiment is as far along as uh, some excavations on the site, I understand. I mean, no, no installations yet. Congress is already being asked to add some more. Now, apparently it takes several years. In one sense, you can never run the test uh, short of actual combat. But certain parts of it uh, you can run. Since it was put in, there's been a decision to change the computer system, which uh, I'm uh, told, though I'm not the expert here by any means, uh, will require uh, two or three years. And while that's going on, uh, you're already going ahead to the uh, next step. Now, this doesn't refute you in any sense. It just says that the political pressures for moving along don't always tolerate uh, the uh, pausing for uh, checking things out and uh, doing the experiments. To which I'd add what I just alluded to. In one sense, you never know whether this will work without running an experiment that by its very nature is uh, terribly dangerous. And uh, that's apparently involved in this case. You see, the thing is not whether under simulated conditions... You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Roger Shin of Union Theological Seminary, New York City, discussed social responsibility and the goals of science. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.